a robust single African free trade area is very much needed. And this is exactly what we're going to discuss today, how such an African continental free trade area needs to be designed, how it needs to be constructed, and in which way EU African trade needs to be uh, adapted to that, designed and maybe eventually even redesigned, because surely those two are interrelated. Uh, since the EU is Africa's most important partner with regard to trade and investment. Are the trade relations too asymm uh, asymmetric? Uh, maybe there are different, will, there will be different opinions among our panelists, but I think that's exactly what the debate is for, to make it even more interesting. And uh, we will start with some inputs. And uh, you know, the lunch debate, the format is, is really is a short format. So we have short inputs and uh, I'm looking really forward to a very vivid exchange. I would like to uh, say a warm welcome to Professor Melako Giboye Desta, who is the Principal Regional Advisor in the Regional Integration and Trade Division at the UN Economic Commission for Africa, ECA in Addis Ababa, where you're also watching her from us right now. I think it's already afternoon over there, if I'm not mistaken. You specialize in, the, in international economic law, and you're also the co-author author of uh, the Global Spotlight um, Governance Spotlight Report on EU-Africa trade, um, whether it's at the crossroads or not. Uh, you have written that report together with David Luke, can, who cannot be uh, with us today, and uh, Simon Merville. So please, uh, Milako, I would like to give, give the floor to you and to give us uh, some food for thought and some first input uh, that we can base our discussion on, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Monica, for, for the introduction. And uh, I think uh, the director has laid out the ground for me very well. I hope you, you all hear me very well. Uh, let me start by thanking the Development and Peace Foundation for publishing our uh, modest contribution to this important debate uh, uh, and for allowing us the opportunity to share our thoughts uh, through this policy launch. Uh, I suspect many of our participants will have seen uh, the paper, uh, which forms the basis for my input here. Uh, I will, of course, be happy to engage in discussions with the audience afterwards. Uh, I have uh, some three uh, key points that I would like to make uh, in, this, in, in my short intervention here. Uh, first, uh, I think uh, to start with the obvious, the EU is by far the most important trading partner for Africa. Uh, and this is not by accident, uh, nor can it be, uh, in my mind, nor can it be explained by history or geography alone. I think there have been deliberate policy choices, uh, especially in the, you know, since the post-colonial period. Uh, and uh, I say this because African, Africa EU trade relations have been underpinned by special arrangements for over half a century. Uh, a key instrument in this respect has been the, uh, the policy of uh, uh, preferential non-reciprocal market access that has been in place since uh, the uh, first Lomé agreement in 1970. Uh, regrettably, however, this uh, non-reciprocal arrangement uh, has come to an end since 2008 when uh, the transition period for the conclusion of reciprocal economic partnership agreements expired, uh, leaving uh, in its wake uh, a patchwork of often bilateral FTA free trade area type agreements, mostly between individual African countries and the European Union. Uh, these EPAs, economic partnership agreements, have impeded regional integration in Africa by providing perverse incentives to African countries to uh, work against uh, their own uh, commitments at the sub-regional level within Africa here. Uh, just to mention one example, uh, the EU uh, already provides uh, unilateral duty-free and quota-free access uh, for uh, LDCs, least developed countries, under the everything but arms law of 2000. Uh, but for developing countries, they have to uh, uh, negotiate reciprocal market access arrangements under the APS. Uh, and of course, uh, geography is such that uh, many of the regional economic communities in Africa uh, are made up of both LDCs as well as developing countries. And when the, develop, the, the LDCs, because they benefit from uh, the everything but arms law, did not see a reason why they should uh, uh, open their markets, uh, then uh, the, the difficulties started arising in terms of forging 
uh, a common position in the in the negotiations with the European Union. So that's what what I'm uh, calling here the perverse incentives. Uh, and secondly, uh, while Africa's trade with the EU has been substantial, uh, intra-African trade has remained marginal. Uh, uh, but the uh, the interesting fact is. Uh, Africa's exports remain concentrated in the primary commodity uh, areas, raw materials, etc., uh, fuels and minerals, and so on and so forth. Uh, whereas intra-African trade is increasingly dominated by manufactured products, uh, and this is where we believe the promise of the African continental free trade area uh, lies. Uh, and we think the EU also needs to adapt its trade policy with Africa to reflect these, these developments. Uh, what this means in practice uh, 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 is that uh, the FTA is promising to overcome, because it's aiming to create a one single market, the CFTA is promising to overcome the old, outdated and damaging division of Africa into uh, North or Mediterranean Africa on the one hand and Sub-Saharan Africa on the other. To this extent, uh, I would hope, one would hope that the EU would also move away from the old and outdated division of Africa and start dealing with the continent as one entity. In trade terms, what this means is uh, merging, for example, the association agreements with the North African countries uh, together with the economic partnership agreements for the rest of Africa. Uh, thirdly, it's important that the EU also realizes, I think it is leadership role in, the, in, in this field uh, globally. Uh, because the EU has moved away from uh, preferential unilateral preferential arrangements, it has made it difficult for Africa, for example, to suggest to other trading partners uh, any deal that is less favorable to them than what Africa has given uh, to the EU. Uh, if I mention just one example, a very pertinent timely example today, the US, the United States has long used the reciprocal nature of economic partnership agreements as one reason why they would not continue with the unilateral preferences of the Africa Growth and Opportunity, Opportunity Act, uh, often called AGOA. Uh, now they are negotiating uh, an EPA-like bilateral free trade agreement with Kenya, for example, which uh, they are uh, wanting to use as a template, as a model for future deals with other African countries. Uh, we know the UK is doing the same. Uh, China, India are already, uh, China has concluded one with uh, Mauritius, India is negotiating another one with Mauritius. So this, you know, uh, one country at a time approach uh, has become uh, the norm uh, in the relationship. And, you know, whatever the EU does in this area, uh, others uh, tend to follow it very closely. Uh, uh, for that reason, we think that the EU should uh, uh, you know, move very carefully uh, in its dealings with Africa. Uh, and and uh, in, in conclusion, uh, what I would like to say is, you know, uh, I would like to call the EU, uh, to, on the EU to pause and consider its trade policy uh, choice with Africa. Uh, it can note the EU does a lot of good, good things in terms of its development policy uh, to support Africa's development. Uh, uh, but when it comes to trade, uh, we see uh, a disconnect between the EU's trade policy on the one hand and the EU's development policy on the other. Uh, they should, there should be some kind of coherence, uh, we believe, on this side. So uh, whatever the EU does, as the director underlined earlier, it should not in any way undermine Africa's vision to create a single market. This is Africa's priority today. Uh, and an Africa that trades increasingly with itself uh, we believe is likely to be a more peaceful, more stable and more prosperous uh, and responsible player in the world. Instead of the recurrent conflicts, instability, migration, etc., uh, that have regrettably defined Africa for far too long, uh, we believe a rising Africa will be a beacon of hope and opportunity for citizens and an attractive market for uh, everyone around the world. Let me stop with this one. Uh, and then I'll, I'll get back, I'll come back uh, when the discussion starts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emilako. Uh, thank you for this uh, very uh, interesting input, input, clear key messages, and also for um, raising our attention to the fact that uh, um, an intra-African 
trade uh, market, a single market would have much more impacts way beyond just economic impacts. Um, so I think that that's very important. Having said that, I would also like to introduce um, my two other panelists. Um, first of all, Sandra Bartelt, um, you're the deputy head of cabinet at the Commissioner for International Partnerships uh, at the European Commission here in Brussels. And prior to that, for instance, you have to be have been the head of unit in, in DEFCO, Development Corporations Legal Affairs Unit. You also have a background in law. So um, yeah, you have also very much worked on these topics. And second, my second uh, partner today on the panel is Esipon um, Oliveira Gomez, your assistant secretary general at the Department of Structural Economic Transformation and Trade Organization of Africa, Caribbean and Pacific States, the ACP countries here in Brussels. And you also, of course, have a long-standing experience in trade and multi-donor programs. So now for you is uh, to react a little bit uh, on, on what we heard from, um, uh, from Melaku. And uh, I would like to turn to Sandra first. Um, we heard uh, what Melako said. He said there is a lot of good things that the EU is, uh, is doing, but when it comes to trade, there is uh, still some disconnection to other uh, policy objectives and a lack of coherence. And he clearly mentioned some very critical points. So uh, from you, I would like to know, do you agree with this analysis? And if not, why not? Um, Yes, thank you. Do you hear me? Yes, we see and hear you now. Okay, so no, um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And uh, thank you for the kind invitation to this uh, policy lunch hosted actually by the representation of my home region. So I'm also happy uh, to contribute here. So um, as was said already previously, the topic is timely. And um, here from uh, the perspective of the cabinet of the Commissioner for International Partnerships, Commissioner Urpilain, uh, we actually have quite a good overview because our commissioner, she is following for the commission, the uh, new strategy with Africa and is also the chief negotiator for the commission on the new partnership agreement with the with the African, Caribbean and Pacific group of states. So from uh, this point, um, it's interesting how everything is now coming together because we have on the one hand, of course, a political framework. We have a legal framework, which is currently being negotiated. We have the financial um, framework, which is coming forward with a multi-annual financial framework that is currently still um, discussed between Council and Parliament. And uh, we also have the trade relations. So um, this is coming together. And now the uh, conclusion of the African continental free trade um, area has already triggered many discussions. It's intriguing uh, um, many colleagues and uh, persons and also has led to the question of a continent to continent free trade agreement ultimately, mm -hmm. as the policy paper is also alluding to. And um, so I uh, personally have the impression that uh, sometimes then we take the second or even the third or the fourth step prior to the first step. Because what we have in front of us is now first that we see the birth of this African continental free trade area, which, which is a huge achievement in itself. And um, this is also why if we are looking now at the African continent, as you all know, it's, um, I mean, a continent composed of 54 states. We have many different regional organizations. We have one organization, the African Union, that is spanning with its membership across the whole continent. So, and, and means when it comes to trade, that as such, the continent is already very much fragmented. And when it comes to trade, it's also the most protected continent we can talk about. So to keep this in mind in our discussion, 
Now may and I, again, sorry, may I just interrupt you for a minute? And at this point in time, because um, it, it's it's interesting to 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 see that and your perception of the African side. But does all that mean that you not agree with uh, what was said, or do you think that the EU um, African trade strategy at this point in time does not have to be adapted because there are other things to be done first? Is that uh, the conclusion a little bit of what you're saying? Uh, as um, what I'm saying is that this political will of the African Union and its member states to establish the African continental free trade area is uh, to be supported, you know, and we are very much in favor of it and we are welcoming it. It has the potential to become a real uh, flagship project and also a flagship for regional trade integration. So, and we are uh, supporting this effort, but what I'm saying is we should not mix it up, this internal integration process within Africa with just jumping to the next conclusion of a continent to continent trade relations. This is what I'm saying. And this is also important to see because now, first of all, is the establishment of it. And this is a huge project, which still takes, will take a lot of time. We are already, supporting this financially uh, with our Pan-African program. And um, when we come to the question of um, how this will uh, change the European trade strategy towards Africa, so um, I can tell you, we, we count on it. We count on it as an uh, important pillar of the new Africa strategy with the EU because the African free trade area will be vital in order to boost intra-African trade and also to, um, to allow for more investments. So, and this is very important and to also reduce the reliance on experts of primary commodities. And in this, we are all going to work uh, together. I mean, after all, This is more and more falling into place. It is only the subsequent steps what we can see, what um, is the effect on this for the EU and in terms of trade relations and the legal requirements for that. So uh, this, is, um, this is my position on this. And now um, when it comes, of course, we are um, supporting a continental approach and to also have a coherent um, policy. But as I said, it's very, the landscape is very diverse and it's also very fragmented. And, um, but I want to highlight also that now with the new uh, multi-annual financial uh, framework, we have already made a, a very big achievement. And this is the um, so-called budgetization of the European Development Fund which serve to finance the geographic cooperation with the um, African, Caribbean and Pacific states. So, and in this respect was um, a different source of financing from the EU budget. And this has also impeded sometimes to have a real continental approach. Now we will have everything together so that we can finance under one instrument, the neighborhood South, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa, which will uh, help us also to have this kind of coherent approach in the continental dimension. Okay, thank and you very much. I think we uh, need to make a little break here uh, with uh, regard to our time, uh, but I think you made your point quite clear. And I would like to turn to Esipion. Uh, same question goes to you. What is your uh, reaction, according to your experience, to what uh, Melako said and also to the paper? Do you agree with the analysis and uh, that um, African, your African trade arrangements need to be adapted um, in order to make the African free trade zone a reality? Please, Esipion. Uh, thank you, Monica. First of all, Shunen uh, Tag, and I'm before. <laughs> Talking, I would really like to emphasize what uh, your president said in his speaking remarks that we all believe, we all hope that Mrs. Okonjo Iwala is named the next uh, Director General of the WTO. So it's very important for us to mark that. Uh, I wanted to thank the authors of the paper. It is very interesting. It's a lot of food for thought. 
I definitely agree that the African continental free trade area is something very important and the OECPS fully supports it. Uh, in order to achieve this continental free trade area, the continent, our brothers and sisters in Africa have to work in facilitating move, movement of people, facilitating movement of, uh, of goods, common recognition of diplomas, and financing infrastructure and putting in place also financial systems. In a lot of these points, the EU Development Corporation is already investing. So I must say as, as the OECPS, as a partner of the European Union, we must recognize that the European Union is funding a lot of the work related to this Africa continental area uh, throughout various programs. I do not necessarily agree on the approach that seems to be, I am not a native English speaking speaker as you see, but the paper seems to blame the European Union for something that is responsible of our African brothers and sisters. And I will never agree on that. I think that uh, Africa has great leaders and Africa is forging its future. That the EPA does not necessarily help regional integration. I agree that EPAs are free trade agreements. They are not development agreements, but it's for each country of ours to decide the best way forward. So there's this separation. And I must say that the, the EU Africa strategy that was mentioned by my colleague before is a joint strategy. It was developed by the leaders of the European Union of the African Union and, seeing, and seeks to make our, our brothers and sisters competitive. About the claim that was said that uh, Agoa, it would seem that uh, my colleague mentioned that Agoa was better. I, I would never consider that Agoa has helped regional integration either. Agoa is working on a country by country basis, at least in principle, IPA tried to have a regional approach, but because of exactly the same situation explained by Mr. Desta in his introduction, the fact of having countries of different development levels and where you can have access to the European Union market without necessarily opening your market under anything but arms gives you a less incentive to not join the EPA, but there was always a choice. So for me, I agree in principle in some of the things said, the technical part, but the underlying principle that is somebody else's fault, whatever, I, I will never take it. I, I, I think we are in charge of our futures and we're forging towards a better future for our children together. So you do not agree with this very heavy criticism saying that um, there are a lot of uh, uh, negative incentives, well, well, contradicting incentives given, uh, which really uh, contradict the, the, the efforts to come to such a free trade zone area. They don't necessarily contradict. Somebody gives you something you decided to take it or not. That is your own sovereign right to use or not. I, I, I Again, I said, I agree that uh, any, the difference between anything but arms and the EPAs may uh, takes our countries to make difficult decisions. But again, at the end of the day, it's our decisions. And I will never contest it. So again, I, I see the European Union as, as a very good partner. Uh, they have offered trade preferences that might in fact, at the short term, uh, hinder regional integration, but it's our decision to take them or to leave them. I do believe a lot in regional integration. I think things are being done. So I also see very positive things of the collaboration with the European Union and the OECPS. Again, a lot of the financial frameworks and financing the future needed to uh, fund this dream of uh, a really uh, an Africa continental free trade that, that we all support. It's also funded by our uh, partners in the European Union. So uh, for me, I agree in the technical part, but in the underlying essence that it's somebody else's fault. No, I, I will never agree on that. Yeah. We have one more question here on my, my plate, uh, what you was also wanted to discuss, if or why do you think the African states should uh, continue to negotiate within the framework of the ACP uh, rather than as EU, African Union? Would you just tell us or uh, tell your opinion on that? For, for me, one does not imply against the other. For me, the African Union is a very important partner and the OECD is also a very important partner. I do not comment the decision of my leaders. The African ministers decided that they wanted to negotiate uh, the post Cotonou agreement with an OECPS framework. That has certain advantages. One of the advantages is that the underlying principle of the OECPS cooperation with the European Union is South South cooperation. It is a very good dream of, of having 79 countries, 
from Africa, the Caribbean and the Pacific discussing together a common future. So I would like to build on that. I see that positive. I do not see it in any case as something against the African Union. On the contrary, the African Union is very active in the negotiations of post cotton and, and it should be, uh, one should never go against the others. I do not believe one or the other. I think that the leaders of Africa decided in a technical way what they consider to be the best administrative solution to negotiate an agreement. I will not comment uh, and will never permit myself to judge uh, what my leaders decided. They, they could have gone another way, it is true, but collaborating within the OECPS has a lot of merit as well. Okay. It, it is very important. The challenges that uh, I would say uh, Seychelles, uh, Comor, Cap Vert have as small island development states are shared in the Caribbean and the Pacific. The challenges of bigger countries like Papua New Guinea is shared with the brothers and sisters in Africa. I believe that the OECPS is a dream, a dream to which I have dedicated almost all my life because I started working in this system in 1990 at a time that I had hair and it all went down. But I do believe in the dream and it was never my understanding, it was never once against the other, it's all together. And Africa is a very important part of that development. Okay. Okay, but I'm sure your hair didn't went down because of too much worries about the African free trade zone. Like, I think so. <laughs> I'm uh, but it, it looks good, by the way. Don't, don't worry. It, 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 it looks very good, nevertheless. Uh, Milako, I would like to, to give the floor once again just for a very brief reaction to those reactions. So just a very, very brief remark from your side, please. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for the reactions from uh, both uh, speakers. Uh, uh, as Mr. Gomez said, uh, uh, you know, he started working on this when he had a hair. I started working on it when I had black hair. Uh, <laughs> so uh, now, I, I let me start with the easier bit. Uh, if I said Agoa uh, was better, is better, etc., uh, I, I I must have misspoken, or you must you must have misunderstood me. No, I didn't say that, or I didn't intend to say that. What I was saying was uh, the U.S. is now uh, negotiating a free trade area uh, modeled, uh, pro most likely more to be modeled after uh, the EPS. Uh, and the argument that the U.S. has against Africa has been, look, yes, we have been giving you lateral uh, uh, access, uh, preferential market access. Uh, but with the EU, you have moved away from that and you have accepted a reciprocal market access. Therefore, there is no reason why we should be giving you unilateral market access while you are giving reciprocal access to the European uh, Union products. That, that, was the, that was what I, what I meant. Wherever the EU goes, others follow the argument I'm trying to emphasize here. Uh, the point about blaming the EU, I think, the, uh, is, is, is a very, a very good point, and that was not the intention of the the paper or the argument. The idea here is, and, and Africa is 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 not uh, free of responsibility here. Uh, uh, what the, the the point we are trying to make here is the approach taken by the EU in terms of the economic partnership agreements. Uh, has been uh, has been done in such a way that to provide incentives to individual countries, particularly the developing African countries, to conclude free trade agreements with the EU, sometimes going against their own uh, regional uh, commitments or continental commitments, possibly in the future. Uh, and this, you are right, of course, uh, these countries can choose not to follow that approach if they, you know, if they, if they wish to, but ultimately uh, interest is matter. So uh, in this case, the EU should be helping those countries to make the right choices rather than giving them incentives to, do the, to take the wrong choices. This is precisely the point that we are trying to make. Okay, Please, thank you. Mm -hmm.